Good morning. Welcome to the 30th anniversary academic sessions. Um, this is a symposium on liver disease and transplant. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Madhulini Riala. He's a professor in gastroenterology, Department of Medicine at the Faculty of Medicine, University of California, Ragama, and an honorary consultant gastroenterologist at the Colombo North Teaching Hospital, Ragama. He's a lead hepatologist in the Colombo North Center for Liver Disease. He's a board certified trainer in gastroenterology and a long-term member and the present secretary of the specialty board, board of study in gastroenterology. He graduated from the University of Colombo and his, had his postgraduate training at the professorial medical unit in Ragama and at the Edinburgh Hospital, Cambridge, UK. His liver disease research interests include nephrid, cirrhosis and its complications, hepatocellular carcinoma and liver transplantation. His luminal gastroenterology research interests include inflammatory bowel disease, tropical gastroenterology, endoscopic techniques and disorders of gut-brain interaction. He has presented over 100 research abstracts at international scientific gatherings uh, such as the Digestive Disease Week and the European Gast uh, Gastrointestinal Week and authored over 60 papers on the above subjects in high-impact indexed peer-reviewed journals. He has also won many leading awards related to research presented in his field, field of interest, both nationally and internationally. In these include the Presidential Research Awards, Vice Chancellor's Research Awards, uh, Dr. E.M. Vijayaram Award for the overall best free, free paper presentation at the SLMA Congress, the Dr. E.M. Vijayaram Award for the best presentation at the annual Congress of the Ceylon College of Physicians, the best research paper at SIMCON. He's a, also an editor for the BMC Gastroenterology Journal. Over to you, Madhuri. Thank you, Chairperson, uh, for that introduction. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be presenting today uh, for this symposium uh, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalani Ragama. And I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for the opportunity. My topic is reducing waiting list morbidity, a medical perspective. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Cirrhosis is defined as an irreversible diffuse process with liver fibrosis, scarring and nodule formation. And cirrhosis is usually the result of long-standing chronic hepatitis. Cirrhosis is a morbid condition and it is associated with frequent hospitalization and high mortality. And only definitive treatment for cirrhosis is liver transplantation. In the natural history of chronic liver disease, long-standing chronic hepatitis will ultimately lead to compensated cirrhosis. And even during this early stage, even with the appearance of varices and the development of clinically significant portal hypertension, the annual mortality rate remains very low, it's less than 4%. So usually these patients who are compensated cirrhotics will not need liver transplantation. However, long-standing compensated cirrhosis will progress to the development of decompensated cirrhosis with the appearance of ascites, upper GI bleeding and hepatic encephalopathy. As you can see, the annual mortality rate in this advanced stage is quite high and is unacceptable ranging from 20 to 60 percent and these are the patients who will need liver transplantation and without liver transplantation they will ultimately develop hepatocellular cancer and die of the liver disease. So the management principle differs at these various stages. In the stage of chronic liver disease we want to prevent the development of compensated cirrhosis through lifestyle changes and disease specific treatments. 
in the stage of compensated cirrhosis we want to prevent the development of complications and decompensation episodes and in the stage of decompensated cirrhosis it is just treating the complications to reduce the mortality in the absence of transplantation and if transplantation is available we should definitely offer this to these decompensated patients the results of liver transplantation is excellent we all know that survival rates are over 90% and 80% at 1 year and 5 years post transplantation respectively this success has led to an increase in indications for liver transplantation the classical the sickest first high male patients as well as inclusion of mild exceptions and early stage hepatocellular cancer therefore more patients are eligible for liver transplantation leading to a competition on the waiting list and those who qualify therefore will have a waiting list time however for these patients who are on the waiting list their cirrhosis will progress with time complications will occur at more frequent intervals through decompensation episodes with the appearance of encephalopathy ascites spontaneous bacterial peritonitis acute kidney injury and upper gi bleed and also that with the development of hepatocellular cancer so management of patients on the waiting list is of prime importance in two folds first to avoid death and drop out from the waiting list and secondly to improve post uh, liver transplant survival rates therefore these listed patients need long term regular follow up and medical treatment i'd like to highlight three things first malnutrition sarcopenia and frailty these three will contribute to most of the uh, morbidity in waiting list patients malnutrition through inadequate increase intake of micro and macronutrients inadequate uptake of macro and micronutrients as well as defective digestion and absorption along with cirrhosis related factors other systemic factors physical inactivity and environmental factors will lead to manifestation of muscle dysfunction mainly through sarcopenia that is loss of muscle mass and frailty increase vulnerability this will in turn lead to increased decompensation episodes increased healthcare utilization with frequent hospital admissions reduced health related quality of life death and also adverse post liver transplant outcomes frailty is a well known term in geriatrics but is relatively new in cirrhosis but it's extremely important frailty is a clinically recognizable state of increased vulnerability resulting in a decline in reserve and function across multiple physiological systems such that the ability to cope with everyday and acute stressors is compromised it commonly coexists with patients with decompensated cirrhosis and is considered to be a predictor of hospitalization and waitlist mortality as well as poor post transplant outcomes how do we overcome these three main uh, factors it is mainly through lifestyle interventions lifestyle interventions unfortunately tend to be overlooked for patients on the waiting list because the life expectancy is just to be too short or the benefit is too difficult to measure but it should be offered to all patients with cirrhosis it's easily implemented with little risk of side effects or cost obesity is an independent risk factor for decompensation the presence of metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance is associated with more severe fibrosis in cirrhosis it predicts the occurrence of liver cancer it is independently associated with liver related mortality therefore overweight patients with compensated cirrhosis should be advised to lose weight to lower their long term risk of liver related complications while on the waiting list we must maintain adequate nutrition in decompensated patients we must address the barriers to intake liberalize the salt intake the previous school of thought was to restrict the salt to less than 6 grams or five, less than 5 grams uh, but now the thought is to make the food more palatable and manage the ascites and the edema with diuretics encourage frequent small meals and minimize the fasting periods for these patients provide nutritional supplements in the form of a late evening snack this is very important 
and provide adequate calories, 35 kilocalories per kilogram per day in non-obese patients, and provide adequate proteins, 1 to 2, 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram for a day, even during episodes of encephalopathy. That's very important. Provide micronutrient repletion. And to achieve this, we might have to consult, most of the time we do consult registered dietitian and nutritionists. Exercise is also very important. Personalized physical activity prescription should be guided by what's called FIT. That is frequency, intensity, time, and type of exercise. For aerobic exercise, the frequency recommended frequency is four to five days for a week. For resistance exercise, it is two to three days for a week. The intensity can be titrated by a talk test so that the patient should be short of breath but should be able to continue a sentence during the exercise. Start slow and build up gradually. That's the time for uh, the time duration for the exercise. For aerobic exercise, it's 150 minutes for a week. For resistant exercises, it is at least more, at least one one day for a week. And the type of exercise can be aerobic, resistance, flexibility, and balance. And to achieve this, and for uh, better adherence, we usually consult a certified physical therapist. Alcohol intake increases the risk of variceal bleeding, increases the risk of decompensation, is an independent risk factor for liver cancer. Therefore, all patients with cirrhosis, irrespective of the clinical stage, should abstain from all alcohol. And there, could, there should be relevant counseling, if appropriate, if the patient needs it. An abstinent should be respective of the liver etiology. And it is mandatory to be considered for liver transplantation that the patient is abstinent. Only two exceptions would be acute on chronic liver failure due to alcohol-related steatohepatitis or acute liver failure due to alcohol-related steatohepatitis where there is no time for the abstinence period. All other patients should abstain completely. Similarly, cigarette smoking is associated with more severe fibrosis in hepatitis C with the development of liver cancer in hepatitis B and it increases post-transplant morbidity and mortality to increase in the cardiovascular events. Therefore, smoking cessation also should be advocated to prevent the progression of liver disease and also to facilitate the eligibility for liver transplantation. We don't want the patient to be smoking when they are considered for liver transplantation. Coffee consumption. The hepatologists usually like to prescribe coffee. It improves all-cause mortality in cirrhosis, reduces the fibrosis, reduces the risk of liver cancer. Most of the benefits is described by consuming at least two to three cups of black unsweetened dip coffee. And this should be encouraged in our patients. What other general measures help? Vaccination. Vaccination against COVID-19, hepatitis A and B viruses, influenza viruses and pneumococcal viruses should be offered as early as possible in the management because the antigenic response is much better in the early stage than when the disease is advanced. Be mindful of prescribing drugs in the presence of cirrhosis. Always bear in mind drug interactions and toxicity. There, is, there will be a need for possible dose reduction for some medications. But testosterone replacement may be helpful to maintain muscle mass in men. Statins are safe. If they are indicated, please prescribe in cirrhotic patients. Statins are safe. Paracetamol also at a dose of 2 grams for a day is quite safe. But avoid harmful medications. NSAIDs, NSAIDs can precipitate GI bleeds and acute kidney injury. Sedatives and CNS acting drugs can precipitate hepatic encephalopathy. Hepatotoxic drugs can precipitate decompensation and acute and chronic liver failure. Herbal therapies, which are overlooked, can lead to life-threatening delay in patients with, that is, drug-induced liver injury in cirrhosis. We always look at the underlying cause and try to treat it. So cause-specific treatment is very important. The underlying liver disease should be treated whenever possible to slow or prevent the progression of the disease while on the waiting list. And these treatments will include antiviral therapy, hepatitis for hepatitis B and C, immunosuppression for autoimmune hepatitis, ursodeoxycholic acid for primary biliary cholangitis, venesection for hemochromatosis, and copper chelators for Wilson's disease. Portal hypertension and com uh, complication is a major cause of morbidity and mortality while on the waiting list. 
portal hypertension rather than the hepatic failure per se is the underlying cause for most of the complications of cirrhosis and subsequent mortality. And hepatic venous pressure gradient is the best surrogate marker for portal hypertension with robust prognostic power. We do not measure this routinely, but we are guided by the stages of hepatic venous pressure gradient for the treatment. All cirrhotic patients at diagnosis should be screened for varices. If they are compensated, we might be able uh, to do away with an endoscopy if the liver stiffness is less than 20 kilopascals and the platelet count is more than 150. So, these patients are less likely to have varices, will not need an endoscopy, but will need this annual non-invasive testing repeatedly. But those patients with compensated cirrhosis with liver stiffness more than 20 kilopascals and platelet counts less than 150 and any decompensated patient will need upper GI endoscopy. And clinically significant portal hypertension is defined as pressure gradient more than 10 where the varices will appear and we manage these varices mostly with non-selective beta blockers and carbidilol has slightly better evidence and we titrate it to induce a bradycardia avoiding hypotension and in patients who are intolerant to beta blocker or who have red signs meaning high risk of bleeding in decompensated patients in place of beta blocker we might use band ligation until the varices are obliterated. When the pressure gradient is more than 12 the varices will bleed and these acute bleeding episodes which should be managed with evidence based standard of care restrictive transfusion policy to maintain hemoglobin around 7, 8, vasoactive drugs pre-endoscopic terlipresin and octreotide and band, timely band ligation within 12 hours post resuscitation uh, from the index bleed. Broad spectrum antibiotics should be given to all patients for at least 5 days. And once the bleeding occurs, we do not want these patients to bleed again. So, secondary prophylaxis should be initiated and this secondary prophylaxis is usually a combination of band ligation and non-selective beta blockers. Tips can be considered in selective patients. A word about beta blockers, beta blockers is usually friendly in these patients. We should try to give it as much as possible. When varices are present but no ascites, we can give the full dose of beta blockers. When varices are present with ascites, in the absence of hypotension, low sodium or AKI, we can reduce the dose and still continue the beta blocker. But be mindful to avoid beta blockers in the presence of varices, ascites and hypotension, persistent low sodium and AKI. We might have to withhold the beta blocker and go on to a uh, banding prophylaxis regime. Another complication of portal hypertension is ascites and the development of ascites is associated with a high one year mortality of 20 percent. Please do paracentesis in all patients with new ascites in the presence of renal dysfunction and in the presence of hepatic encephalopathy because we want to exclude diagnose and treat spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Please remember that paracentesis is not contraindicated in the presence of deranged INR and low platelets. So, in cirrhosis, the portal hypertension is driven by splanctic vasodilatation, peripheral vas vasodilatation. This is contributed to by, by what is called PAMPs and DAMPs, pathogen associated molecular patterns from gut translocation and damage associated molecular patterns from ongoing liver injury. And this results in reduced effective blood volume, sodium retention and increased cardiac output leading to ascites. And we manage ascites according to standard of care, salt restriction, sodium less than 2 grams or salt less than 5 grams, combination of diuretics, spironolactone with or without frusamide. We have to stop the ACE inhibitors, AR2 blockers, we avoid nephrotoxic drugs and we consider the eligibility of transplantation because once ascites is there, there is a 20 percent annual mortality. With further decompensation, there will be renal vasoconstriction and decreased cardiac output leading to refractory ascites and this is managed with large volume paracentesis. We remove about 5 liters and replace with albumin and we can also consider tips in these patients. So, do uh, restrict the sodium when there is ascites, do give the diuretics in the prescribed ratio, spironolactone and frusamide, we assess the response by weight loss. 
Don't do large volume parasitizing is unnecessary if there is no tensicitis. Avoid nephrotoxic drugs. Don't over diuresis. Don't under diuresis. And TIPS is not a first line. It is considered very selectively. Another important complication with high mortality is acute kidney injury. Up to about 30 patients with cirrhotics who are admitted will have AKI. And please remember that HRS is not the commonest cause of AKI in cirrhosis. It is pre-renal and sepsis related ATA. It, the presence of AKI will increase the mortality by seven times. Early recognition and intervention is important to improve outcomes. And the new diagnostic criteria only requires a rise in 0.3 milligram per deciliter within 48 hours, a very small rise, and this should be addressed in our patients. Once the patient is diagnosed, hospitalized, diagnosed with AKI, we have to actively look for infection, do the cultures, stop the drugs, nephrotoxic drugs, volume expand with IV fluids and blood if needed, and please give albumin for two days. And if there is improvement, it's pre-renal. If there is no improvement and HRS criteria are met, treat as for HRS with vasoconstrictors and albumin. And if there is no, if the, if the criteria doesn't meet, we have to treat it as, as ATA with renal replacement. Another important complication with high mortality is encephalopathy. And encephalopathy, the development of encephalopathy is an ominous sign in cirrhosis with annual mortality rates rising to 60%. So avoid the precipitance of encephalopathy in patients with cirrhosis. Avoid dehydration. Don't over diuresis. Don't give too much of laxatives. Avoid renal dysfunction. Avoid CNS medications, depressing medications. Treat GDI bleeding. Actively look for infection and treat it. And during an episode, identify and treat the precipitant. That's very important. Give lactulose, lax laxatives adequately to maintain two to four bowel motions. Add rifaximin if there is persistent hepatic encephalopathy or if the patient is intolerant to lactulose. We might have to use uh, polyethylene glycol containing laxatives or any mass if it is severe. And once these patients develop encephalopathy, we have to prevent recurrences by using lactulose, rifaximin, and avoiding the precipitants, and very importantly, maintaining muscle mass through adequate nutrition and protein intake. And I would stress on this again that please do not restrict the diet in these patients, continue to give normal proteins. The last complication I want to touch upon is hepatocellular carcinoma. So hepatocellular carcinoma can develop at any stage of cirrhosis from all the causes. So our waiting list patients who do, did not have HCC might develop an HCC during the waiting list time. So they should all be included in a HCC surveillance program. And the guidelines recommend that we do six monthly ultrasound with or without AFP. If the AFP is available, please do it. But ultrasound six monthly is mandatory. And therapy is, if the patient develops HCC or is, if a patient is listed with an HCC, we will have to treat it. And most of these patients will belong to the early stage of HCC, Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer Stage 0, A or B. If they are A or B, we can offer them uh, ablation while on the waiting list. If they are stage B, we can offer a taste to downstage the cancer. So in conclusion, Chairperson, cirrhotic patients awaiting transplant need regular follow-up. Reducing the waiting list morbidity and mortality includes initiating lifestyle modification to address malnutrition, sarcopenia, and frailty. Very important. We should look for a specific cause and commence disease-specific therapy if possible. And we have to prevent and treat the complications such as portal hypertension, ascites, varices, acute kidney injury, hepatic encephalopathy, and look out for hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is our unit, the Columbo North Center for Liver Diseases, and the team available that is responsible for looking after these patients, pre-transplant, peritransplant, and post-transplant. An excellent team. I'm proud to be part of this team. And this is our goal. This is where we want to go. We want to build a center for liver disease to cater for both pediatric and adult patients from all over the country. And uh, this we hope to do through the liver, uh, Revive Liver Fund, and I invite all of you to donate generously to this cause. Thank you. Uh, happy trick questions. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Any questions from the audience? Okay, in the we'll absence of questions, we can even take the questions later on. Uh, it gives me a uh, great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Professor Rohan Sriwadana. Professor Rohan Sriwadana is a professor in gastrointestinal surgery, Department of Surgery and Colombo North Center for Liver Disease, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. He had his undergraduate training at the University of Colombo, uh, where he also had his postgraduate training. He trained in Hong Kong at the University of Hong Kong, Department of Surgery, on the G.B. Ong Fellowship in Hepatobiliary and Liver Transplant Surgery. He was awarded the P.R. Anthony's Gold Medal for Surgery. He has multiple publications in index journals with an H index of 7 and 181 citations. He, has award, he was awarded three orations for his work. He has held multiple positions in the College of Surgeons, the Hepatopancreatic Obliary Association of Sri Lanka, the Gastroenter uh, Gastroenterological Society of Sri Lanka and the Board of Studies in GI Surgery, Surgery and Critical Care. He is a member of the Working Group on Organ Transplant at the Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka. And, the, and a member of the National Transplant Advisory, uh, Advisory Board. He's a president-elect of the Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology. He has been awarded, he has, he's a recipient of multiple awards, including the President's Award for Research Publications and the Vice Chancellor's Award. He holds three patents for his uh, inventions. And Professor Sirivadana led the team that performed the first living donor transplant in Sri Lanka in 2013 performed the first liver transplantation for acute liver failure in Sri Lanka, and he has played a key role in establishing the Colombo North Center for Liver Disease, which is the first center in the country to uh, reach a milestone of 50 liver transplants. The center, oh, he headed the team which carried out the first pediatric liver transplant in Sri Lanka as well. It gives me great, great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Sirivadan, and I invite him to continue the talk. Uh, thank you, Bhagat. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to take part in this uh, symposium. Uh, I think uh, all of you have seen this gentleman in the center. He is uh, Charles Darwin. And around him, you can see these birds, they are Darwin's finches. In 1845, Charles Darwin uh, went to islands of Galapagos and he observed that in, in island of Galapagos, he observed that there are, there are these finch, uh, finches in the same species, but when, when he closely observed these finches, he noticed that their beaks were different. Their beaks were different because their food patterns the type of food that they had to eat, abundance of food was different in these islands. And as a result uh, that he faced, uh, the, these birds faced for different challenges to gather this food, uh, they, their, uh, their beaks changed. So talking about food, this is a type of food that we eat. Every day we eat a big plate of rice. And this has been our traditional food. But when you look back, when, you, we, when we look back, our generations, our grandfathers, great-grandfathers, they also ate the same plate of rice. But they worked in their paddy fields from morning to evening very hardly. But still, we also eat the same plate of rice. But our lifestyles have changed. After eating this big plate of rice, we sit in one place, probably stare at the computer, maybe sit down and read books, and we do not spend time to spend the calories that we have gathered. And this has been a problem around the world. And the amount of calorie intakes has tremendously increased around the world. And this has changed. And, and this has changed us. And some of you might not believe in evolution. But if you look around, actually the evolution is change. And if you look around, it doesn't take a lot of time to change. If you closely look at these changes, and if you close look at these two photographs, one on the left hand side, 
was taken by R. L. Spittle in 18, uh, in 1945, when he saw these Vedas. And if you look at the same group of people, same native people, on the right hand side, you can appreciate the change of appearance uh, of these native people. And this is a result of that change in the diet patterns that, that we are facing. About 10-15 years ago, we did not study uh, metabolic syndrome, but now the metabolic syndrome is one of the main topics that we discuss and the type of things that we learn have also changed. Metabolic syndrome is a group of diseases. It's not a single disease. It's a group of diseases, collection of a lot of the diseases which happens as a result of increase, as a result of change in our diet habits. We take more, but we spend less. And in these groups, group of diseases, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is one of the main main uh, components. Why we should be talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is because we are, as Sri Lankans, we are right at the center, we are right at the red zone of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We have one of the highest incidences of this disease in the world. And this is one of the highly cited articles that has been published and coming from our, in, from University of Kalania. Uh, this data comes around uh, data is originating from around 2010-2012. To, uh, around In that period, when we looked at our populations, 35, close to 35% of our people, urban population, had fatty liver disease. But now, actual figure has increased. When we see much, much more patients than that, and roughly, our recent studies show that around 40 to 45% of our population has fatty liver disease. Now, this, I think, is the most alarming slide. If you take Sri Lankan population as 21 million, if you take 35% of our population has fatty liver disease, we are looking at about 7 million people with fatty liver disease. But some of them will progress. Some of them will progress into steatohepatitis. And some of them will progress into cirrhosis. And at a given point of time, you are looking at almost 1 million patients with, fat, with cirrhosis. And once you develop cirrhosis, we know that there is no other treatment apart from liver transplantation that will cure them. And not all the patients, but some of the patients will require liver transplantation at a given point of time. And, and we are looking at a massive number of patients. We are looking at almost half, a, almost 500 patients at a given point of time which requires liver transplantation. This is a massive number. And we are sitting at a verge of epidemic of liver disease. We are nowadays, we are talking about epidemic of kidney disease and the burden that it has in our health system. But we are sitting right, at, right in front of epidemic of liver disease. And very soon, very soon our wards are going to get flooded with patients with cirrhosis. And we have seen this. We have already published this some time back. And because the, our disease pattern is different. If you look at West, the cirrhosis is predominantly because of alcohol induced cirrhosis, alcohol and hepatitis C. If you look at East, it is predominantly hepatitis B and C. But our disease pattern is different. We don't see hepatitis B and C in our country a lot. Mainly, our patients develop cirrhosis as a result of NASH and its complications. And we have seen 80% of the patients who are referred to our liver transplant clinic, they are, they are because of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this is something that we expected to see around the world, and we are already seeing this in our country. So that is why we should be talking about cirrhosis because of NAFLD, and this is going to be a major, major problem in our country in the future. Now, liver transplant has been happening around the world more than 60 years of years now. In Sri Lanka, we've been doing transplant for the last uh, 10 years. Liver transplantation in NAFLD is not the same as other causes. There are a lot of special challenges that we have to face in the presence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and that is our topic today. And I'll try to take you through briefly through this topic, why liver transplantation with NAFLD is different from other causes. Now, we discussed earlier, NAFLD is a group of disease of metabolic syndrome, which leads to NAFLD. It's a group of disease. It's not a single disease. When you have fatty liver, you have other diseases, a package. When you have fatty liver, you get diabetes, you get hypertension, you get your obese, and you have cardiac diseases. And we all know that presence of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cardiac diseases, in the presence of these comorbidities, six, seven, or 10 hour surgery is going to be very complex because their systems are not optimal. You are looking at damaged kidneys. They are more prone to get infections. 
the hypertensive of their hearts are not, not functioning normally. They have atheros atherosclerotic diseases. So because of all these, they can develop complications during the surgery and they are very likely to develop perioperative, immediate perioperative complications. So selection of patients are extremely important. What you see in West, what you see in East, you can't practice in Sri Lanka because if you select patients based on that, you are going to go into trouble because our patients are different and, and, and our patients with these comorbidities, if you transplant each and every patient, they are going to go into trouble. So preoperative assessment is extremely important and to ex select these patients is extremely important. For example, if you are looking at a patient with, uh, with ischemic heart disease, with, uh, with cardiac risk factors, under normal circumstances, we might do an echo or maybe a dobutamine stress test. But in, in the background of NAFLD, we might go a further a little bit further and we might think of doing uh, invasive procedure in uh, uh, CT angiograms or coronary angiograms to exclude the presence of cardiac disease. So it's complex. It's not like looking at a patient without non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The problem does not end here. After transplantation, this is a follow-up, five-year follow-up of patients after transplantation. And we expect generally a better survival in the present, in, in, uh, in trans, uh, when you transplant for other indications. But in NAFLD, 25%, close to 25% of the patients did die at five years. And cardiovascular diseases is one of the key contributors for death. So it's important, the presence of multiple system involvement can affect the long-term outcome as well. When we looked at our survivors for more than five years, 75% of them developed the original disease in their transplanted liver. And this is another problem because they are genetically predisposed and their lifestyle goes back to your previous lifestyle. Their transplanted liver also develop the original disease. And, and this is another major, major problem uh, once you transplant uh, uh, patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we are facing challenges because we are at a, at, a, at a beginning of a transplant program, because we can't check, take chances. We have to select our patients very carefully. And we are operating difficult patients with a lot of comorbid comorbidities at the early part of our program. So this is one of the major challenges that we face. And also sometimes in our setup, following up these patients is also different, difficult, especially when they come from faraway places. So they might not adhere to our advices sometimes, because, especially because we can't uh, keep on the dialogue. So looking at the donors that we get, in the top that you see a pristine liver, a perfect liver, a purple, a pink color pur liver. This is the kind of liver that you would like to transplant. But the story is not like that in most of the instances. In Sri Lanka, we see these kind of livers that you see in the bottom like cheese balls. And this is the liver, if you look carefully, around this liver, you can see the, water, uh, the fluid has become a bit whitish in color. That is because when you spit the liver, the fat comes out and it, it, it has given this uh, whitish color. And these are the kind of livers that we get to transplant. The problem with fatty livers, fatty donors is that on the left hand side you see a normal liver, normal hepatocyte, and there is a good parenchymal perfusion. But in steer, so, uh, with the fatty liver, you, your, fat, your hepatocytes are swollen. When the hepatocytes are swollen, the parenchyma is compressed and the microcirculation is disrupted. The liver does not get a good blood supply into the parenchyma. And they have the eyes rel rel relative ischemia in the parenchyma. This is a complex story. I'm just trying to simplify it. When the parenchyma is hypoxic, there is hypoxic uh, uh, there is oxidative injury in the, in the mitochondria. Eventually, there is low ATP levels in the hepatocytes, and they have their free radical, the levels of free radicals or uh, oxygen species are high in their hepatocytes. And especially, this is a problem when they are exposed to cold and warm ischemia. When there is ischemia, when their livers are taken out from the body, harvested out from the body, this injury is amplified. And this is even more amplified when the organ is reperfused, uh, when the new liver is implanted and reperfused. And these free radicals, they damage the hepatocytes and they swell up. And they are more and more prone to get primary non-function and delayed graft function and other complications. So there's these livers, they do not perform like normal livers. But we 
find solutions. People find solutions when there are problems. And this is one of the solutions that is coming up. Normothermic or hypothermic liver preservation. When the liver is taken out from the body, rather than a traditional preservation, the liver can be connected to this machine and perfused. And that takes off uh, the ischemic injury or that minimizes the ischemic injury. And this is one of the techniques, one of the new developments that is coming up which can be very effective in the presence of fatty liver disease. But there are problems in our practice. Already liver transplant is costly in our, costly in our country. And it has additional cost. For, to, to, to perform one liver transplantation with a machine, it costs additional about 1 to 1.5 million rupees. And this is a problem that we will have to overcome in the future. Now, these are live donors that we have performed, live donor liver transplants. The beauty of live donor liver transplantation is you can plan the surgery unlike the cadaveric transplant. And you can plan and you can optimize your donors. Now, still, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease can cause problems in living donor liver transplantation. The first donor death that happened in Japan is a result of a donor who had fatty liver disease and the donor went into liver failure and died. And especially for us, in the beginning of liver transplantation program, if we get a donor death, that is going to be devastating for a program. So we are very careful. And when we looked at our donors, that we op uh, live donors that we operated and that we evaluated, we had to turn down half of our donors because they had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and we did not want to take any chances. But as I mentioned earlier, we, are so we have solutions when we have problems. And this is a solution that people are, uh, people are coming up with. There are various, because we have time, because we have time uh, with live donors, we can optimize these donors. There are, there are various strategies that people are coming up with uh, to defat the livers. Sometimes they are diet and exercise programs. Sometimes uh, special drugs like omega-3 fatty acids, Optifast. With, this with these strict schedules, their weight can be reduced and the liver can be defat. And these livers do well after transplantation, and we are also starting to practice these new, uh, new strategies. So there are many problems with liver transplantation in the background of a population who's having 50% of our population is having fatty liver disease, and we are facing major problems, but still there are strategies to overcome. So we are failing in the sea of liver transplantation when there is turbulence, with this turbulence of fatty liver disease but our boat is very old. We want something like this, and this is our dream. This is what we want to achieve. And I think the university is moving towards the right direction in supporting to set up the center of liver disease and transplantation, which is one of kind in the country, which will offer clinical services, which will train new people for the country, and which will also contribute to the research. And that, I think, will bring changes for liver transplantation in this country. Thank you very much. Take the questions at the end of the session. Um, it gives me great pleasure in introducing Professor Dimitri Bezinova, uh, our guest speaker from this uh, for this symposium on liver disease and transplant. He's a professor of anesthesiology and perioperative medicine and the director of transplant anesthesia, Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine at the Pennsylvania State College of Medicine, USA. He's a board certified anesthetist and an intensivist in Germany and in the United States of America. His research interests include liver transplant in high risk NASH, hyponatremia in CSCD, coagulopathy and thrombosis in CSCD, organ preservation and immune suppression. He has, uh, has co-authored more than 80 research articles published in Transplant Direct, Transplantation, Anesthesiology, Minerva Anesthesiology, Research Practice in Thrombosis and Hemostasis, Liver Transplantation, and the British Journal of Anesthesia. He has over 550 citations. He is the lead, lead author of the recently published Consensus uh, Guideline 
on hemodyne, managing hemodynamic instability in liver transplant, published by the International Liver Transplant Society and the Liver Intensive Care Group of Europe. He's a journal review for anesthesiology, transplantation, liver transplantation, clinical transplantation, and the, uh, the American Journal of Transplantation, seminars in cardiothoracic and vascular anesthesia, analysis of transplantation, and hemodialysis international. He's a chair of IRTS Anesthesia and Critical Care Committee, and an active member of the Liver Intensive Care Group of Europe, Association of Anesthetists um, of uh, Europe and the United States of America. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce, uh, welcome Professor Bezinova, who has been a personal friend and an advisor. Uh, when, whenever we run into difficulties in our transplants, we have always contacted him and he's uh, helped us immensely. Good morning, Dimitri, welcome. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, this nice uh, invitation. And I, I, I hope everyone can hear me. I can hear me double now, but I will try to deal with this. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here. You see my background. This is um, city of Berlin. I'm trained in Berlin in Peter Neuhaus program, but this is uh, happened that I moved to the United States and I was fortunate to be involved in liver transplantation in different countries. And my topic today is anesthesia with disease challenges for anesthesiologists. And let's start. Uh, I, will, I would like to start my talk with a case presence. It was a patient. Uh, uh, with hepatitis C and uh, also with Crohn disease. And because of Crohn disease and because of potential obstruction of the bowel, he received this surgery. Uh, his condition was st stable, male score was 18. I'm not sure if you're using uh, male score in Sri Lanka, but um, this is about what we uh, see frequently. This is, not, this is uh, not very high male score. And you see um, INR fibrinogen platelets, um, everything abnormal, but nothing really crazy. Yeah, basically, we usually not transplanting patient in with male score 18. This is patient's thrombolastogram. You see also nothing crazy. The maximal amplitude it will decrease, uh, the angle it will decrease, but this is what would you expect in the patient with male score 18. Uh, about Perioperative management of this patient. Uh, Preoperative, he received Kisentra. Kisentra is protrambial complex concentrate, what we use actually started to use in the United States um, a lot. Intraoperatively, he received some crystalloids, some colloids, more Kisentra, basically because we like to reduce uh, fluid administration of this patient. We will talk about that a little bit later. He received fibrinogen concentrate. And uh, surgery went well, patient was extubated postoperatively, everyone was happy. However, two weeks later, patient developed encephalopathy, severe ascites, and you see his INR fibrinogen uh, platelets and his male score now 38. And exactly two weeks after his surgery, uh, this uh, actually, this is two weeks after his surgery, and exactly one month after his initial surgery, the patient was transplanted. Now, the male score of this patient was 18. With a male score 18 uh, in cirrhotic patient, postoperative 30 day mortality is about 35%. Postoperative 90 day mortality is 40%. That's a sky high. Question is, why is it? And short answer is portal hypertension. What is going on in this patient? This patient have a cirrhotic liver, and because of cirrhotic liver, this patient have a high pressure and high resistance in the portal system. In the same time, the patient have a high level of aldosterone because of several reasons, because of hepatorenal syndrome and also because aldosterone metabolized in the liver. And because of high level of aldosterone, we see in this patient retention of sodium in water. The problem is the patient cannot deal with this because 
with a low protein production and low colloid osmotic pressure and the losing this water in ascites. Now, we have this problem. We have a two connection system, high pressure system in the portal, in the portal uh, system and systemic circulation with a low pressure. If you have a two system with a different pressure, this patient will develop sharing forces uh, release of nitric oxide and increase of cyclic GMP. What lead with a uh, with what leads uh, lead to vasodilatation? Initial vasodilatation happened in the portal system. What lead to still effect from systemic circulation in even higher drop in the blood pressure? Uh, as consequence, we see low perfusion of intestine with a release of uh, endotoxin cytokines, with even more release of nitric oxide and even more blood drop of the blood pressure with profound systemic vasodilatation. Little bit about cardiovascular pathology in the patient with end-stage liver disease. Again, idea is exactly the same. The patient have a hypovolemia and systemic vasodilatation. And because of that, they have a, this three main problem. They have a hyperdynamic sepsis-like situation uh, in the systemic circulation. They have an electrolyte abnormality and also they have a structural change in the catecholamine receptors. This leads to profound hemodynamic instability. A few words about uh, CD, coronary artery disease in the patient with end-stage liver disease. For the long time, we were absolutely convinced that patients with end-stage liver disease are protected against CD because they have a low production of cholesterol, they have a low systemic pressure, they have a high level of estrogen, what is protective against uh, CD. However, now we know that this is not the case. The patient with end-stage liver disease prone to CD in about the same degree like general population. This is about 6.1%, but in some population like NASH, um, the um, uh, prevalence of CD is even high, up to 21%. Uh, probably we know, you know the study, what I uh, cited here is a study from Plotkin from 1996 about the perioperative mortality and morbidity liver transplant patient versus what is very high. However, this is very old study, very small study. I believe it was involved only 30 patients. But based on this small study, we have a, this developed approach for evaluation of CD in the patient with end-stage liver disease. Usually we're using, uh, this is a recommendation of American Association for Study for um, Liver Disease. Dobutamine stress echo uses a screening test for low risk patient. Uh, you can use cardiac tomography with a um, calcium score for medium risk patient. You can use spectrum PET scan, aerobic threshold, coronary angiography. However, I wanted to introduce for you this study. It's actually introduced. Study was published in 2013. If you don't know, the study is actually very interesting. Study uh, Chris Ray from uh, Los Angeles. He was the lead after for this study. It was a multi-center study, retrospective, but probably this is one of the biggest studies in liver transplant patient what was done. It was altogether 360 liver transplant recipient. They underwent coronary angiography before transplant. Uh, 40, 470 patients didn't have CD. It means stenosis was below 50%. And 151 patients had the stenosis greater than 50%. From this population, 50 had a moderate, moderate CD between 50 and 70 percent. Um, 96 had a severe COD, more than 70 percent, and more than 70 percent had a multi-vessel disease. Uh, well, what happened with this patient? Again, this is a retrospective study. Uh, 80 patients uh, underwent different type of coronary intervention before transplant. Um, uh, two patients received PTCA, uh, some patients received uh, stent placement. Uh, it was a cabbage done combined uh, with the liver transplantation. Now the most interesting part. 71 patients did not receive 
any intervention. I don't know why. As a retrospective study, it was not possible to figure out. From this 71 patient, it was a 25 patient severe stenosis. It means stenosis of coronary artery more than 70%. Yeah. We didn't receive any intervention, but were transplanted. And was it any difference in outcome? In answer is absolutely no. It was no difference in mortality in any outcome between negative CD and positive uh, CD, between negative, between patient with multi-vessel and single vessel disease. And if you check any outcome in the study, it was absolutely no difference forever. What is, what, what is the study is important for us? Uh, probably our understanding about significance of end-stage liver disease in this patient should be reconsidered and risk of transplantation in this patient population, probably similar like in other populations. And uh, let's talk about cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. Uh, this is uh, in this study, this is also relative uh, all studies, actually not study, but review the broadest question. What is cirrhotic cardiomyopathy? This is not precise definition, challenging diagnosis. Do we have any imaging test, any plasma markers? But again, this is relatively all study. Actually, this question's already answered and answer is, Cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, we have a, uh, in 2008, it was a consensus conference and we don't have any doubts about cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. Uh, AF in this patient below 55% was generally not terribly bad, but in, in patient with end-stage liver disease, they're actually hyperdynamic. This is very low AF. They have prolonged QTC, they have frequently increased BNP or pro-BNP. Most importantly, this patient have a change in the structure of beta receptors because end-stage liver disease is metabolic disease. Uh, and because of that, this patient is not responding usually to catecholamines. Uh, how about diagnostic of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy? This is actually very difficult. We're talking about cirrhotic cardiomyopathy in patient with a diastolic dysfunction, low resting F, uh, BNP, pro-BNP above 400, uh, helping for diagnosis, high sensitivity troponin, uh, also helpful. What we're supposed to do if we have a suspect of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy? This is contraindication for transplant. For just now, no, but only recommendation what we can give now, we should avoid increased pre and after load fluctuation in this patient, in especially overload. A few words about fluid management in patients with end-stage liver disease. This is a picture from uh, Dr. Mukhtar from Egypt, good friend of mine. See, if you have a patient usual patient, if you're giving this patient fluid bolus, this fluid bolus would be administrated, distributed equally in all compartments of the body. And this fluid bolus will correspond to in increase of right atrial pressure. In patient with end-stage liver disease, situation is different. Fluid bolus will be redistributed mostly in the portal circulation because significant vasodilatation in this area, it will not correspond in increase in right uh, atrial pressure. What does it mean for us? Basically, the telling us that patient with end-stage disease should really kept dry to avoid shifting of the fluid, fluid in this area because this will lead with a significant bleeding. Um, and uh, not going to help us at all. We just uh, talk about cirrhotic cardiomyopathy and this is another reason to keep this patient dry. For just now, uh, this is official recommendation for management of patients with end-stage liver disease. 
Just few words about hepaterino uh, syndrome in this patient. The reason for hepaterino syndrome is exactly the same. This patient have a release of endotoxin and cytokines and glucagon. They have a portal hypertension and release of nitric oxide. This lead to systemic vasodilatation, low systemic pressure because of hypovolemia, and uh, decrease renal perfusion with a subsequent release of all the substances and cortical vasoconstriction and kidney failure. Uh, as an anesthesiologist, we're not dealing a lot with this problem, but sometimes, uh, depends on the institution, <clears throat> we uh, use uh, renal replacement therapy during the during the liver transplant. In our institution, we uh, doing we doing it relatively frequently and is helping us to keep the patient stable. <clears throat> Few words about the pathophysiology of portopulmonary hypertension and hepatin. Uh, uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. Why is this happening in this patient population? The reason is exactly the same. We have a hyperdynamic circulation with high cardiac output, what lead to sharing stresses in the pulmonary tree. And then we can have a three different situation. In majority of the patient, we have a maintenance of the normal vascular tone with no difference. Some patients have a significant vasodilatation with hepatopulmonary syndrome. Some patients have a vasoconstriction with portopulmonary hypertension, what initially reversible, but if we have a continued, continued overstimulation, this is going to be irreversible. Few words about the hepatopulmonary syndrome. In the last definition, hepatopulmonary syndrome is this, uh, defined a vasodilatation with abnormal uh, arterial oxyg oxygenation with abnormal alveolar arterial gradient more than 15 millimeter mercury or more than 20 in all the patient. Incidence is between 4 and 32 percent. C variation is very high. Uh, Hepatopulmonary syndrome it's not associated with agenda, age, or liver disease severity or etiology. Usually, not always, but usually re resolved after liver transplantation. Uh, this is important to understand that this is two mechanisms of a hepatopulmonary syndrome. Because of ease of nitric oxide, from one point of view, we see activation of existing shunts and shunting the blood away from, alveo uh, from alveoli. Uh, or they produce such a significant vasodilatation, there's this erythrocyte, the far away from alveoli, they're not going to be oxygenated and shunting away. Um, diagnosis usual uh, by uh, TTE, TTE is a usual recommendation for Evaluation for this patient at least once in a year uh, with a bubble study. And we have, if we see the bubbles after three or more cycles, this is diagnostic for hepatopulmonary syndrome. For patient with other pulmonary uh, problems, you can use uh, technetium uh, labeled um, albumin. Usually we need just supportive therapy, oxygen administration, but sometimes we need more significant therapy and uh, liver transplantation is definitive treatment for this patient. Portopulmonary hypertension, uh, this is much more significant condition, more tricky condition, uh, more severe condition. This is increased resistance to pulmonary arterial flow in the setting of portal hypertension. Uh, we're talking about uh, portopulmonary hypertension if mean pulmonary pressure above uh, 25, and uh, pulmonary resistance more than three wood units uh, in the setting of low wage pressure and uh, transpulmonary gradient more than 12. We're talking about mild uh, portopulmonary hypertension if it is between 25 and 35, moderate as is, uh, if uh, pulmonary pressure below 45, and severe as is more than 45. And this is usually associated with a low cardiac output, what is going to be contraindication for liver transplantation. 
Visi porto pulmonary hypertension um, prevalence of this condition is lower than porto uh, than hepatopulmonary syndrome, just five to six percent. This is we don't know how much time is necessary to develop porto pulmonary hypertension. This is not related to etiology of uh, uh, liver disease and no correlation between severity of hepatic dysfunction and severity of portal pulmonary hypertension. This is important to understand that on the level of microcirculation, the patients can have a both portal pulmonary syndrome and portal pulmonary hypertension. What is the problem in the liver transplantation? Uh, problem is that portal pulmonary hypertension is associated with uh, chronic right ventricular dysfunction. And during the reperfusion, in we can see combination of chronic and acute right ventricular dysfunction, what we actually frequently cannot handle during the liver transplant. And um, we think in a recommendation that if mean pulmonary pressure below 35, that's a safer transplant this patient. However, if mean pulmonary pressure um, is above, um, above 35, Five, this is associated with higher mortality. And if this is around 50, mortality is close to 100%. Why this happened? This is exactly what we discussed. Uh, it's this combination of acute and chronic right ventricular dysfunction. What to do? Uh, for evaluation um, of portal pulmonary hypertension, we use TT uh, once in a year at least. A recent recommendation if right ventricular systolic pressure above 45, uh, we perform right heart catheterization. Uh, function of right ventricle is crucial. Yeah. Uh, if you have uh, increased pulmonary pressure, but with a good right ventricular function, you can consider liver transplantation. But if this right ventricular function is not perfect, we, in the setting of increased pulmonary pressure, this patient should not be transplanted. Uh, usual management is usual. We're using, we're using prostacycline, prion postoperatively, endotoline receptor antagonists, phosphodiesterase FAS5 inhibitors, and intraoperatively, we can use uh, tools like hyperventilation, low fluid administration, uh, IV phosphodiesterase inhibitor, and inhalation. Oxide. Uh, about hyponatremia, why the patient with end stage liver disease having hyponatremia? You know, this actually resorption of the sodium is increased. The reason the same portal hypertension. This patient have a low systemic pressure because of hypovolemia and systemic vasodilatation, what lead to activation of carotid sinus bioreceptors activation of a release of ADH, what lead to um, activation of vasopressin 2 receptors and dilutional hyponatremia. It means the patient not really have a very low level of uh, sodium. They have too much free water. Why we are worried so much about hyponatremia? Uh, First of all, because of hyponatremia and perioperative survival, hyponatremia might be associated with neurological problem and hyponatremia might be associated with osmotic demilization syndrome. But I believe uh, we have another significant problem, but in our head, we, many centers in the United States will not transplant patient with hyponatremia because we believe that hyponatremia is responsible for very high mortality, but this is, this is not true. Hyponatremia is just, is the marker of mortality. Uh, and um, hyponatremia reason for mortality in only very, uh, only few cases. In all these cases are uh, osmotic demilization syndrome. Osmotic demilization syndrome, that's this condition what we used to call CPM. CPM is not really correct terminology because uh, this is not necessary in pons and can be everywhere. Associated with rapidly developing uh, quadriplegia, disarter mutism, uh, frequently not reversible. And the problem is the patient with end stage liver disease 
that have a worse outcome. We most frequently dying because of ODS, we have a most frequently disability and less frequently recovery. <clears throat> what is the incidence of osmotic demilization syndrome? It's actually relatively low, between 0.8 and 1.4 percent, but this is much higher than in general population. Uh, there, this has happened usually uh, one, two weeks after transplant. More than 50% of ODS in general population have a good outcome. However, this is not in case in end-stage liver disease. This patient have a much higher morbidity and mortality and less likely recovery. What should we do? You see, this is like progress of our recommendation how we should adjust osmotic demilization syndrome. Oh, I'm sorry, hyponatremia. And the last recommendation was done in 2000, uh, not to exceed, uh, not to exceed more than uh, four or uh, eight units in 24 hours. Uh, however, this is study done in patients with end-stage liver disease. And they actually shown that osmotic demilization syndrome can happen even with a very mild uh, correction of sodium with uh, four units in 24 hours. Why is this happening? Because of this. Uh, during the transplant or during the big abdominal surgery, for example, in patients with end-stage liver disease, we have to correct fluid, we have to correct uh, coagulation and see, for example, FFP associated with <coughs> very high sodium load. Uh, the same sodium bicarbonate. If you're using CVVH with the usual sodium, it also will increase your, CV, your uh, sodium concentration. Question is what to do? Well, uh, I don't know if this is available in Sri Lanka, but for example, PCC, protribin complex concentrate, available in Europe for many, many years. Uh, in the United States, I believe for the last five years, you can use PCC instead of FFP. You can use fibrinogen concentrate increase uh, instead of cryo. We can use THEM. THEM was not available in the United States for like three years. This is available again. Uh, you can use uh, hypotonic solution and you can use CVVH with lower sodium concentration. <clears throat> Only caveat here uh, in the United States, for example, this is not commercially available. The pharmacy have to do it for you and the, sometimes they're reluctant to do. What is the current recommendation? But think about that, that majority of the centers would not perform liver transplantation with serum sodium below 120. Again, what this is actually not right. You can do it if you perform right intraoperative management. Uh, However, if you have a patient with a chronic symptomatic hyponatremia, the serum sodium concentration below 125, it should be carefully treated if major surgery or transplant is imminent and current recommendation not to, um, to adjust sodium, not more than four to six equivalent in 24 hours. And this again, this is not going to be 100% guarantee that osmotic demilization syndrome will not develop. Few words about thrombosis in, in stage liver disease. Um, for the long time, we were not sure that end stage liver disease actually associated with thrombosis, but after evaluation of, of large database, <clears throat> this is no question anymore. It was shown that incidence of VTE in hospital patient with a chronic liver disease is up to 8%. If you compare a patient with end-stage liver disease and without, you can see the, patient the prevalence of uh, thrombosis doubled in patient with cirrhosis. Um, this is our patient with um, a patient for a living donor liver transplant, you can see clot here in the right atrium. This is another patient. You can see here clot, relatively small clot. We didn't do anything for this, for treatment of this clot, but you will see it relatively frequently. This is another patient. You can see here catheter and small clot here. And this is unfortunately also our patient 
could die on the table and you see it's a significant clotting everywhere. Clotting in end-stage liver disease is not unusual. Why is this happening? To keep it short, the most frequently this has happened because of endothelial dysfunction. Patient with end-stage liver disease, they have an active endotoxin um, translocation. The gradient of endotoxins highest in portal systemic circulation, endotoxemia and nitric oxide dysregulation lead to endothelial dysfunction. Concentration of liver independent coagulation factors like von Willebrand factors and factor seven increase up to 200%. PEA1 also significantly increase, especially in the patient with uh, acute uh, liver failure. Uh, the patient with NSH liver disease, they have a problem with um, a primary hemostatic in and very low production from ADAM13 in liver. And ADAM13 is it's necessary to uh, destroy von Willebrand factor and, in, and increased von, von Willebrand factor most likely this is most crucial and key factor about how hypercoagulability in end-stage liver disease. Altogether, this results is normal platelets adhesion. Uh, thrombomodulin. Thrombomodulin is an endothelial receptor. Thrombomodulin is necessary to activate uh, protein C with active uh, protein C in presence of thrombin and necessary to stop thrombin generation. Is the patient with end stage liver disease have a resistance to thrombomodulin because of endothelial dysfunction and thrombin production is actually unstoppable. They also have a defect in the clot quality. The clot is very firm with decreased permeability and this is more difficult to uh, destroy uh, this clot. All these factors are uh, helping this patient to have normal coagulation or increase coagulation. This is why the patient with end stage liver disease, they can bleed to death, but actually they can also clot to death. This is algorithm what we developed and published, and now everyone using it. This is what to do with intracardiac clotting in the patient with end stage liver disease during the liver transplant. If we have a small clot more than one centimeter and patient is stable and it's just trend, we're going to just monitor this clot. If it is a bigger clot, a propagating clot, we usually given uh, some heparin until target PGT of 60. And actually, patient doing very well with this. If patient getting unstable, we giving RTPA up to four milligram. And if patient need a CPR, you give them more RTPA and this is necessary, you can use ECMO or cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, in the past, it was given much higher dose of RTPA up to 40 milligram. At majority the patient of patient were dying on the table. <clears throat> but usually actually low dose of RTPA up to four milligram, we starting with 0.5 milligram, it's very effective. And, and to conclude my presentation, um, I wanted to show this photo. I don't know if someone know who is this person here, uh, you certainly don't, you certainly know his name. This is Dr. Antonio Altreta. You know him as Altreta Pecky score. Uh, he developed the score. He um, published several papers in vascular anesthesia, for example. He had about 900 citations, but I don't know if you ever heard that Dr. Antonio Altreta was person who performed first in the history Anesthesia for first liver transplant with Dr. Thomas Tarzel. Uh, he published his experience with the liver transplant and he told that this is not just big abdominal surgery, this is th something completely 
different, speaking about the complexity. And he also first pointed that not just anesthesiologists, but special liver transplant anesthesiologists are specially trained liver transplant anesthesiologists uh, necessary for this procedure. In conclusion, liver transplantation in big abdominal surgery patient with end-stage liver disease, this is very risky business. We have to focus on details and see the big picture. Thank you. Please ask me a question. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, in the absence of questions from the audience, can I ask you a question, Dimitri? So, please. Yeah. All right, Dimitri, uh, you, I know you practice um, this uh, new protocol for enhanced recovery after liver transplant. Can you tell us briefly what it involves? Well, I mean, see, that. This is a very big topic, yeah, about, about enhanced recovery. For just now, actually, in, in January, uh, it is going to be a big conference, ILTS. We, we're taking, we, we, again, we're trying to, to, to have a big picture about enhanced recovery. When we're talking about enhanced recovery, we're mostly talking about early extubation. But we like to have, a, again, a um, picture about enhanced recovery in different part of the liver transplantation, uh, different uh, type of liver transplantation, for example, pain management and so on. However, uh, to keep it short, for example, to, we're trying to extubate everybody on the table. I learned it in Berlin. We actually in Berlin, in my time, we extubated everybody, independent of the condition, yeah, very successfully. But you have to prepare the patient to extubation. It means you keeping the patient dry during the surgery anyway is helpful. You usually stop administration of opioids in unhepatic phase completely. With consideration, uh, patient already receive relatively high level of opioids before unhepatic phase and Old liver, cirrhotic liver, prob most likely could not take care of this of metabolization of this medication, and new liver can uh, still cannot take take care of this. And because of this, you can start opioid very early. Uh, stop, I'm sorry, stop opioid very early and prepare in this way uh, the patient with a uh, uh, early extubation and the same with uh, uh, pressors. And uh, basically, uh, if PF ratio, Horowitz index, um, uh, PAO2 uh, to, to FIO2 above 250, we extubating um, every patient on the table. What uh, very helpful, what decrease uh, level of infection, decrease, uh, improve hemodynamics, yeah, and also decrease cost. But again, this is only a small uh, part of the ERAS protocol. Another thing what um, we probably, we, we, we doing um, in this patient, for example, we're not giving the patient in first 48 hours any hydromorphone because hydromorphone has active metabolites. And idea is the liver most likely cannot um, take care of this. However, the problem with entire situation is it's barely any purpose about this. Really, almost nothing. Yeah, uh, genuinely transplant patients. We have a majority of the papers is this retrospective papers, but in this area, in the pain management, uh, I can tell you, uh, in liver transplantation uh, patients, this is almost no papers. Now came a few papers, a very interesting paper about epidural catheters in these patients, but uh, basically about the about the uh, pharmacodynamic of medications in these patients, this is no papers. But this is like, like entire understanding. And again, it's going to be meeting uh, ILTS meeting in January, and we will 
uh, we will talk much more about this. And after this meeting, we are, uh, it's, it's just a rust meeting. And after this meeting, we are uh, planning to publish several, several papers. Our papers, uh, our group working on the uh, recommendation for, this is recomm all recommendation based on the great approach. Uh, our group working on recommendation about the administration of uh, blood and blood components, use of antifibrinolytics, and uh, use of viscoelastic testing. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Dimitri, uh, for joining us at, I know it's about one o'clock in the morning for you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, sharing your uh, experiences with us. Thank you very much for this invitation. It was a pleasure to join this great meeting. Thank you. Uh, I have one question for Professor Rohan Sirwadhan. Um, Professor Rohan Sirwadhan mentioned that uh, we are managing with very low resources and we've got a solution in the form of uh, the new center for uh, liver disease in Ragama. Uh, Rohan, can you brief us on this project, please? Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, we have been doing transplants for the last uh, 10 years and uh, we have excellent team as far as human resources are concerned. Uh, but uh, the problem why transplant has not progressed in Sri Lanka and is progressing very slowly, I think is because of the resources that we have in the infrastructure, uh, uh, especially in our hospital at uh, the North Colombo Teaching Hospital. So if we have, if we can sort out the infrastructure, we know that uh, we can proceed further. Uh, but at the same time, it's not, uh, I think, focusing only on clinical services is not the way forward for a university. I think with the clinical services, it's important that we train people, uh, train the future, because trainees are very important and that is what will bring the change. So it's important to train, change, uh, train people and train our future, uh, future clinicians. And also, uh, it's important to contribute to research. So basically, we are focusing on all these three areas. Uh, so that uh, this will bring up a change uh, for the future of uh, liver transplant in Sri Lanka and that will, and as a, as a university, I think uh, we should be happy uh, that we are doing something for the country. Can I call upon Professor Janaki Visanti, Senior Professor and Dean of the Faculty? to hand over the certificates of uh, appreciation to the resource persons, please. Thank you.